This is The Jason Jones Show, powered by Mudhouse Media. Now, here's Jason Jones. Aloha, everybody, and welcome to The Jason Jones Show. I am your host, Jason Jones, broadcasting from the beautiful hill country of Texas. I just got back from Washington, D.C. I had an incredible week. Really one of the most productive weeks I had. uh, I gave several speeches. I did several media interviews, including I was uh, the man on the street doing a live report for Steve Bannon. Was interviewed by uh, Crisis Magazine. That was a great interview. I'll put that interview in the show notes. Uh, My main reason for being there was to do the work of the great campaign of the Vulnerable People Project and advocate uh, for the Uyghur. Uh, Also, I went to a softball game with and watched pro-life Kids, uh, pro-life interns, and, and, and young, young adults play lefties, leftists, uh, and, and, and we got creamed. I have to say the pro-life kids got creamed, but that was great. And uh, so, But that was a good break between all of my meetings, all of my interviews, and, um, and all of my speeches. I had gave three speeches, three speeches in one week while I was there on top of everything else. And then uh, tomorrow... As soon as I uh, get off the show, I am loading my car up and getting ready because me and my boys are going to go on an eight-day adventure. Most of the time, kayaking with some friends down a river, and uh, I'll tell you all about more about where we went uh, when we're done, when we, when, we, when we get back. Cannot wait for that. But today, I um, oh, one of the things I did while I was in Washington, D.C., and one of the speeches that I gave was at the Bishop's Conference. Students for Life of America put on an event, uh, several cities across the country. I had the privilege of being a speaker at the Washington, D.C. event. We called on the bishops to commit to writing a letter addressing politicians like Joe Biden receiving communion. And the day after our event, it was announced that the bishops, in fact, are going to be writing a letter. But already the media, leftist politicians, the abortion industry, And bishops and some bishops are already working to sabotage the letter. And what they're saying is, among other things, they're saying one of two things. We should pump the brakes. This is too soon. Too soon. I'm a grandfather. And pro-abortion politicians have been receiving communion since before I was born. So I don't see how this is too soon. So that's one. Maybe we need to take some more time. You know, it's only been uh, 50 years we need to take some more time. And then the other, uh, uh, the other line, of course, you already know, it's the seamless garment line. Well, if we're going to uh, deny politicians like Joe Biden for uh, communion because of uh, their position on abortion, then we should you know, deny people communion who disagree with uh, the bishop's statements on a minimum wage. Well, that we all know is foolish. And so I have on as my guest, John Zmirak, the interview starts out strange. But stick around because it's a great show. I don't even know what we started talking about in the beginning. It was my fault. I I took us in a weird direction. But um, this is a a great interview because this is a great opportunity, and I'm just going to sum it up. The bishops are supposed to come out with this letter in November. And if you're not Catholic, let me tell you now, this is going to be one of the biggest news stories in the world. It's already big. It's in the New York Times today. This is going to be earth-shattering, culture-changing, It's going to be tremendous, and here's what's going to happen. The bishops are going to write this letter, so they say, on the reception of the Eucharist by politicians who publicly advocate the intentional direct killing of the most innocent members of the human family, the child in the womb, and what the position is on this. Well, there's only one position the church can arrive at, and that is you cannot receive communion if you support the intentional destruction of the most vulnerable members of the human family, the child in the womb. That's very clear. Every Catholic knows that, right? And if you don't know that, It's because you're not bright. That's all I can say. You're not thoughtful. You're not bright. You don't think too hard. You're not interested in understanding. You don't Google around. You don't grab a catechism. You don't, you know, you just don't care. You want your whims to be true. That's what it means. I mean, what you want, your whims to be true, how you feel, that's the truth. And if someone disagrees with you, they're wrong. But if you want to know what the real teaching of the church is, it's very accessible. And it's simply this. To advocate killing innocent people is a mortal sin, okay? And if you're in a state of mortal sin, you cannot present yourself to communion. It is not really rocket science at all. Illiterate peasants all over the world understood it for 2,000 years. 
And uh, so you can get it too. You can get it too. Our bishops can get it too. And if they pretend, and if you see a cardinal pretending not to understand it, he's gaslighting you and he's dishonest. And if you're like, well, he's not gaslighting me, you're right. He knows that he can gaslight a significant number of the population because they're not that bright. He knows it. And so he's shameless and has no respect, right? But here's the opportunity. Here's the opportunity before us. Number one, as this debate rages, we have an opportunity to teach. And, if, and, 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 and you have an opportunity, if you're not Catholic, to learn something beautiful with the oldest and largest institution in the world teaches about this central sacrament, the Eucharist. Okay? Communion. This is a great opportunity for them to learn about our culture, our religion, our belief. Great opportunity for us to teach the world what we believe on the Eucharist, what we know to be true about the Eucharist. Number two, we get to teach the world what, we t- what the Catholic Church teaches about the inviolable dignity of the human person. And here, this is magnificent, and John Zmerich says this in the interview. The, um, the Church's teaching on human dignity is accessible through reason alone. So to reject it is to reject reason. And the church's teaching on the Eucharist is you can only understand through faith. So it's to reject faith. So when someone purports to be a Catholic and they seem confused on this issue of a pro-abortion politician receiving the Eucharist, what they're demonstrating is they reject faith and reason. Bam, it is that simple. Cardinal Gregory, read his statements and ask the question, does he reject faith and reason? Hmm, I don't know. And then the other brilliant, wonderful opportunity is we get to expose the seamless garment for the farce that it is. We go into this in depth. So let's just get on with the show. This episode is being brought to you by Movie to Movement, promoting a culture of life, love, and beauty through the power of film. Go to our website, movietomovement.com. Check out all of our movies. This episode is also being brought to you by the Vulnerable People Project. Go to thegreatcampaign.org. We have a lot of projects going forward. We've been getting a lot of monthly donors from this show. It's very important. We need, we need to grow our organization. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We're going to be at a big, uh, we just sponsored a big religious freedom conference that's being hosted by Ambassador Brownback later in July. Uh, so we need monthly donors. Go to thegreatcampaign.org. When you become a monthly donor, $5, $10, whatever you can do a month, you stand shoulder to shoulder with us. And that's how we do all of our projects and programs. Um, This episode is also being brought to you by my favorite pillow, your favorite pillow, from one of our favorite human beings on the earth, Mike Lindell. It is going to be a hot summer. You need a pillow. You need a pillow that you don't have to flip over back and forth all night because it's hot. You need need the Giza Dream Sheets. I'm not going to get into all the reasons why it's it's going to be a hot. If you if you live in Texas where I live, with how hot and humid it is, you need central air, and you need Giza Dream sheets. I can't help you with the central air, but I can help you with the Giza Dream sheets and the My Pillow. Go to mypillow.com, use the code Jones, and they're going to get the pillow and those sheets right off to you. All right, now with the great John Smirak, it's the Jason Jones. Show. John Smirak, welcome to the Jason Jones Show. Thank you, Jason. It's always good to talk to you, even when the subjects are grim and serious. Well, I was excited to talk to you, and then as we were just talking, um, you told me about your most recent article where you have a quote from me, and it has to do with dogs and the Eucharist and abortion, and I hope you are not expanding the seamless garment. I hope no, that, no, I'm not. I hope this isn't no, John no. Smirak. You know, Michael Vick will never <laughs> be able to receive. And Michael Vick has been excommunicated. Oh, I would do that. I would do more. Than that. <laughs> I know but you anyway, would. You I, look, I don't want to excommunicate people who are abusive to animals. I want to get Tanya Harding to break their kneecaps. Okay, so you use, let's leave the church out. You use Tanya Harding for everything. She's your go-to for. Yeah. Tanya Harding. Well, I was just. Oh, go we ahead. We were just talking, Jason. Yeah. Jason and I were just talking about the the idea that tr- tranny guys 
who pretend to be women who want to steal gold medals in the Olympics might actually get to compete in the Olympics. And I was saying that the Olympic Committee needs to hire Tanya Harding and Jeff Galuli and his friends, and that these are the people who should evaluate and deal with men who want to beat up girls on the rugby field or steal their scholarships to college or steal their gold medals in the Olympics. Yeah, no, this is, I, I, I expect in like five years, there'll be, you know, men's competition and trans. It'll be just men and men, men and then men in dresses. Yeah. That'll be it. <laughs> That'll be it. They won't, but will they be wearing even dresses? I don't even think they'll have to do that. They'll just, they won't cling to such really... binary, archaic, you know, uh, costumes of the past that we use to subjugate women. They can just dress like they, you know, any other dude. I want the guy from Tiger King to present one of his tigers and claim that it identifies as human so it can take part in the Olympic wrestling competition. Say that Why again? not? Say that again? You want Tiger the guy King? Who, who, the guy with the tiger from Tiger King, the TV yeah, show. He's in prison. Who has a private zoo of tigers. Yes. He needs to bring one of his tigers, fill out the paperwork, and say this tiger identifies as human and wants to take part in the Olympic wrestling or boxing competition. Why not? We've digressed. Yeah, yeah maybe not. Okay, now we're well, we're going to talk about three the th- three very important things right now. So we started out kind of silly. Okay. But I'm I'm actually right. very excited about what we're going to talk about. And all of America and much of the world is going to be talking about today's show. Not our show. Not us. But the topic of today's show for months and months and months and months to come. The bishops have stepped into it. They've been walked into a trap. And I am excited about that. I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I think they've walked into a trap that is going to be a beautiful opportunity to talk about three wonderful things. First of all, the Eucharist. Uh, Second off, the dignity of the human person, especially the child in the womb. We're going to get a lot of talk about that. And then finally, we're going to get to talk about Catholic social teaching and once and for all expose the fraud that goes by the name Seamless Garment and why this is all going to happen is the bishops have announced that they will be writing a document on basically addressing Biden and politicians like Biden receiving the Eucharist. And this is a tremendous yeah. opportunity like we have never had in the modern church. It's a tremendous scandal that the church could actually fix. Um, this is one scandal we can do something about. I think the bishops have been confronted by their own people, the grassroots activists, people like you, Jason, People, the only Catholics who actually care, the only kind who actually give to seminaries, raise money instead of just getting it from the federal government, uh, do the spiritual or corporal works of mercy, the only actual practicing Catholics, as opposed to legacy Catholicism, which is basically Democrat politicians with Italian or Irish last names, uh, organizing big city Democrat machines and ethnic neighborhoods to vote for the party that will give them the most money from the government. Um, That's not the future of the church. That's the future of the Episcopal church. That is to say, no church. These bishops, are some of them are seeing that they can turn into a giant real estate holding corporation like the Episcopal Church, with no believers, but a lot of nice old buildings and uh, pretty big endowments. Or they can go in the direction of the evangelical churches, which are full of real enthusiastic believers who are pushing back against the culture. And uh, so are they going to be pagan or are they going to be Christian? And uh, this is the fork in the road. If you can't agree that killing unborn children for sexual convenience, then selling their body parts for profit, using them for cosmetics, using them for vaccines like the COVID vaccine, uh, using them in Frankenstein experiments like Anthony Fauci was doing at the University of Pittsburgh. He was funding an, uh, hideous experiments with the, the scalps of dead babies from Planned Parenthood being put on the skulls of mice. You know, it's really crucial. I guess that's to help rock stars grow new hair and uh we're going to see unborn babies livers cloned and given to uh wealthy alcoholics just the way we're seeing uyghurs in china being cut up 
alive by the government and their organs sold on the international organ market, as Forbes magazine reported. Yeah, and, this is not some internet rumor. And, and John, you want to know what's very sad? I was with Prime Minister Salih Hudaya, Prime Minister in exile. He came to my speech last week. I addressed a group of Anglicans, pro-life Anglicans, and he was, uh, he, he, he was, it was, I was quite surprised he made time to come to the event. And he shared with us that the market, one of the biggest markets for Uyghur organs is in the Muslim community because they, uh-huh. they want organs. They're halal? They're halal. <laughs> uh, no, no, for real. That's it. That's a, They're halal. Wow. They want organs that are halal. Wow. I mean, we as... That, uh... It's, that is in group solidarity of a kind that, <laughs> that we should not approve we should not approve of. I that. mean it's bizarre, it's disgusting, it's unimaginable, but yet we have it here. Now John, here's what I want. I want to start just keep this real basic for the audience. For those who aren't Catholic and maybe those who are Catholic but are, have been ridiculously poorly formed, right? So you'd have to be really ignorant of your faith to believe that you could write laws, vote for laws uh, write bills, sign bills into law that supported the direct intentional killing of a human being, including the child in the womb, and then present yourself to communion. You'd have to be really... Well, you'd have... Go ahead, yeah. Poorly formed, you know, really poorly formed, or the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington. Right, or... So this Rose is... Gregory. So this is what I want to get to. So any Catholic and every Catholic, you know, I know, all of us... Catholics, we know we commit any mortal sin. We need to go to confession before we present ourselves to communion. If Canon Law 915, which I think most Catholics understand, if um, if I am advocating sin, not that I'm a sinner, but that I am publicly advocating sin, you know, like advocating abortion publicly and through my position in government, that I am now excommunicated and I am not to present myself to communion and to return to what? communion is much more of a, a difficult process than simply going to confession. So when Gregory well, let's plug, or let, theologians, yeah, let's real quick, John, I want to get this out. So right, when we when yeah. we hear theologians or bishops um, pretend this doesn't matter, they are being they're lie they're being publicly they're being dishonest, right? What what do we say about a Catholic who knows? Biden shouldn't be receiving communion, yet advocates Biden receiving communion. What what do we say about what what is what what is there to say about them other than they are not Catholic? I don't care if they're a bishop. Well, I would like some Catholic politician, like I don't know Rick Santorum, somebody known for being Catholic, and I would like you know somebody who's still in Congress. Okay, we need somebody in Congress to introduce a bill suggesting. That the bo- that we build a border wall and we electrify the fence so that anyone who touches it dies instantly. Would that person be allowed Holy Communion by local by our bishops? Or if, if we had a congressman support repealing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or if we had a congressman who proposed the death penalty for, for shoplifting, it's obvious these bishops, these leftist bishops are the ones trying to politicize Catholicism left, right, and center. They are trying to basically trying to run the government. While the sex abuse crisis was happening under their very noses, while Bishop Cardinal McCarrick was picking which American bishops got which dioceses, while they were shuffling pedophiles from city to city, the U.S. Catholic Conference was issuing 200 or more policy statements per year, 200 more more per year. That's more than the laws that our Congress used to pass in the 19th century in a year. The U.S. Catholic bishops, whenever you, especially there's a Republican in office, they act like they're the Polish government in exile in 1940 in London, and, and they are the legitimate government of the United States. And they weigh in on how much we should be spending on, on child food nutrition, how, much, how many immigrants we should be letting in, what's an inhumane way of detaining immigrants, how we should do prison reform. They're offering to run the entire country. Meanwhile, their own schools and parishes are in a pedophile epidemic. Uh, these bishops believe in mixing religion and politics. They're constantly using their positions as bishops, as heads of the local church, heirs of the apostles, to weigh in on, 
labor union negotiations, you know, school choice vouchers, even when they're right, you know, as they are in school choice, they are mixing religion and politics. But then when it comes to something really basic, sorry, Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> you hey, you tell Mike. your dogs this Mike. is not the Eric Metaxa oh. show, all right? They're not allowed. To, they're not allowed to just, <laughs> just chime just, in just, in this show like it's, it's it's the it's the Eric Metaxa show. <laughs> when it comes to should we kill babies for sexual convenience? That's all abortion is. It's killing babies for sexual convenience. All the arguments, fundamental arguments that people make, are about. Well, I shouldn't have to choose between having a sex life and going to law school, or I shouldn't have to choose between you know, building an extra wing to the house and, and having a baby. Um, contraception fails sometimes, and it's a fundamental part of women's freedom to be able to terminate a pregnancy. That is killing children for sexual convenience. Can we agree? Yeah, but, John, I think you're wrong on something. I think that if Senator if a, Senator Tam, Tom Tancredo, wherever he is nowadays, ran for office again and advocated electrifying the border to kill immigrants— they, they would probably be silent because I notice when anything's very severe and serious and important, they become confused, befuddled, they slink away. You know, when there's COVID and people are dying, whether or not they should get last rights, they are silent. Where did the bishops well, go? Okay. How about this? Well, In Central and South America, when I do work down there and my fellow pro-lifers, I'll probably never be invited back again because I make, I've been making this point a lot lately. They're, you know, I, I hear the church very loud on abortion in countries where abortion is illegal, but these countries have such structural economic injustice that people are willing to low crawl uh, from their country to our country, you know, for a hope of some sort of hope of freedom, you know, but they're silent on structural economic injustice. Here in America, where we're the empire of the culture of death, um, they're confused on whether or not Joe Biden should receive communion, but they're going on and on and on all about Black Lives Matter, yet they're silent on the genocide of Uyghurs, not a single peep, not a single word. Um, you know, and we can go back to World War I. The original incarnation of the USCCB was founded to push us into uh, what Pat Buchanan called the unnecessary war, an absurd war, a tragic war. Um, where were they when we dropped two atomic bombs? Silent. Now, Archbishop Fulton Sheen made a very powerful speech in September 1945 that was probably embarrassing to his bishops at the time. Um, but... Well, I agree that institutional cowardice is a real thing, but I will point out that when Tom Tancredo wanted to speak at Providence College, the local bishop stepped in and forbade the college to have him speak because he had a different position on immigration from the local bishop. When Laura Ingram wanted to speak to a pro-life group, I believe it was in uh, Nevada, uh, it might have been Colorado, the local bishop stepped in and said she couldn't be the speaker because she violated the bishop's position on immigration. So I think well, in America clear it is bishop... kind of partisan. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They are partisan because let's be clear what the bishop's position is on immigration. Uh, allowing the cartels and human traffickers to secure the border so that an endless stream of vulnerable migrants could come into the American economy and, and be exploited. I mean, that's got to right. be the position, and, right? Well, what they want is they, they see, according to Pew Research, 40%, 4 out of 10 uh, uh, American Catholics leave the church, never to return. If 40% of Toyotas exploded when you put them in reverse, somebody would lose his job, but not the bishops losing four souls out of 10. So rather than evangelize, they just want to steal sheep from Mexico and Central America. They want to keep the pews full of new people, keep them warm, even if those people will lose their faith here in America. And, and that, a high percentage of immigrants who come to America as Catholics leave the church. Um, we, we, can, we know this because according to the latest, I think it was also Pew Research, more than 50 percent of Hispanics in America no longer identify as Catholic. More than, more than half. Uh, more than half. half. More than half. So the bishops can't even hold on to the sheep that they steal from Latin America. They're not evangelizing. How could you evangelize when you have these lavender seminaries and these lackluster liturgies and constant sex scandals, plus the bishops, 40% or more of their annual budget comes from federal nonprofit contracts? 
most of them to do with processing immigrant immigrants on behalf of the U.S. government. So the U.S. Catholic Church is like a subsidized tariff protected auto company in the early 1970s, turning out clunkers because they don't face any competition. They don't face any discipline from the market. They can just go on feather bedding the, the, the factories and paying themselves fat bonuses. And now, so here we are. Somehow, now I had the privilege last week of participating in a rally in front of the USCCB in Washington, D.C., um, calling for our bishops to write this letter, which they now say they're going to write, addressing the reception of the Eucharist by pro-abortion politicians. And um, so I think this is a very good thing, but probably not for the reasons that I'm, I, I know not for a lot of reasons I see from other Catholics. Other Catholics think they're going to get this wonderful document that's very clear that if you're a Catholic and you support the intentional direct killing of an innocent human person, the child in the womb, you can't receive communion. I do not think that's going to happen. What I think is going to happen is bishops and theologians and Catholic politicians like Ted Liu are going to call for a massive expansion that the church has to have integrity. And this has to apply to all of the countless issues that um, these dilettantes have taken positions on. Yeah, yeah. And so there'll be a whole checklist. Yeah, and so the, the seamless garment, which you and I have talked about, is a utopian set of demands. It says, if you're not going to kill unborn babies in the womb, you also have to basically pay their way through college and make sure that they get affirmative action and make sure that they have health care and benefits and every good thing in the world that most of our ancestors didn't have until about 30 years ago. Unless you're going to, to basically set up a trust fund for every child in America by the U.S. government and make sure that their lives are pretty much perfect, you can't stop people from killing them in the womb. Yeah, no, and by the way, you and I, we have been writing relentlessly since we've been writing together on, on you know, trying to stop pointless regime change wars like in Iraq and in Syria, Libya. Uh, we've been writing, but we don't have allies from the consistent ethic, from the seamless garment left. They're talking about the LGBT issues. They're not there for the right. Uyghur. I don't see the Catholic consistent life, the consist. The, where are they? There's not a single... Catholic on the left that I can think of that has talked about the most serious issues of our age, whether it's a no, shattering course. Iraq, abandoning Iraq, um, lusting to shatter Syria, uh, shattering Libya, Libya. Uh, you know, silence, nowhere to be found. But the, the, forever, yeah. look, look at the two most prominent celebrity priests, James Martin, which he slow walked elderly Catholics from pious devotionals to LGBT ideology over 30 years. That was his job, and he did it well. And then Bishop Barron, his job was to seduce uh, Catholics who made bad choices in their children's Catholic education by sending them to horrible diocesan Catholic schools, horrible Jesuit schools, wrote big checks. Now their kids left the faith, and then Bishop Barron's there to say, I can, I can speak about Catholicism in a way that's attractive to your child who... Uh, was repulsed by the faith uh, with their horrible Catholic education. And that's the game he's playing. Yeah. And ne neither of these two celebrity priests talks about any important issue ever, ever, not once ever. No. Well, you know, people, there's a new trinity abro abroad, Caesar, Mammon, and Sodom. And the legacy Catholic church we see around us is very well attuned to pleasing Caesar, Mammon, and Sodom. By Caesar, I mean big government run by free spending Democrats and whatever the policies of the federal government are, usually set by, by wealthy elites in the Northeast and Silicon Valley. Mammon, the agenda of massive corporations like Amazon and Google and Facebook. And Sodom, which is to say the cultural complex that has risen to power the sexual revolutionaries who have now become the sexual dictators who want to force all of society to adopt the same Hugh Hefner, Marquis de Sade, Margaret Sanger hedonism that they've been championing 
for you know hundreds of years since the Marquis de Sade. You know, the Marquis de Sade was the first philosopher since the ancient world to argue for, that abortion was morally and legally cor correct, that abortion was a woman's right. The first person was that pervert kidnapper who tortured women, the Marquis de Sade, who spent most of his life rightly in an insane asylum. That is the man who uh, his ideology on sex was popularized by Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, and it became the creed of second wave feminism, and it was also the creed of the sexual revolution. These maniacs uh, have now come to power. Their, their apostles have come to power. Planned Parenthood gets hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government. Um, last week, I interviewed Lila Rhodes. She was talking about how when she exposed Planned Parenthood through a series of uh, undercover stings in the, in the late, in the middle 90s, showing Planned Parenthood would cover up sex traffickers, cover up for pimps that would bring in underage, underage girls and try to get them abortions against the law. Planned Parenthood would cooperate. Planned Parenthood would take checks from people who said, I only want this used to abort black babies. Planned Parenthood would say, oh yeah, and they would cash the check. When she did, she exposed all that. The Republicans on Capitol Hill voted to defund Planned Parenthood. All the Democrat, Democrats had to do would say, would say, oh no, we're gonna shut down the government. You'll be blamed for that. They're gonna close Mount Rushmore and, and Yellowstone. And the Republicans folded like a cheap tent. So that's what I mean by, by the Sodom. Okay, so Caesar, Mammon, and Sodom, the three powers that dominate modern society in the West, uh, when they snap their fingers, a certain kind of flexible Catholic steps forward, his hair is perfectly coiffed, he's wearing a Roman collar for once, and he will represent the agenda of Caesar, Mammon, and Sodom to the people, because he is a Sadducee. If you think back to the time of our Lord, the Sadducees were liberal Jews who didn't believe in life after death, who didn't keep the whole law, they didn't accept the whole Old Testament, but they were the representatives of the Jews to Caesar and of Caesar to the Jews. So Caesar gave them the gave the Sadducees the orders, and the Sadducees tried to get all the Jews to obey them. And when the Jews had a grievance, they gave it to the Sadducees, who would try to filter it and see if he could get a few concessions out of out of uh, the procurator like Pilate. Our bishops are the Sadducees. They're not even Pharisees. At least some of the Pharisees were trying. But. And, and this sounds this sounds dark and tragic, but but I think the great opportunity we have now is we're going to get to talk about the Eucharist and the Catholic teaching on the nature and dignity of the human person, and we're going to get to talk about authentic Catholic social teaching. You know the 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 first thing I'm already looking right here in there uh, as as we were talking, and I was looking at all these theologians, a professor from. Uh, St. Louis, um, Washington University in St. Louis said, you know, it's a sad commentary with all this going on in the world that they get together to do this. There are so many other important issues, yada, yada, yada. Why don't they also mention, you know, the death penalty? Or um, Martin goes on to say, you know, Trump was divorced yet. Yeah, well, he wasn't Catholic. C can you address the, the difference between an issue like Trump being divorced or the death penalty and abortion? And they know the Only difference, right? The think. bishops know the difference. Theologians know the difference. College professors know the difference. But they're going to pretend there's no difference because they're dishonest. Well, it's like a food critic who uh, he will not give a restaurant, any restaurant, a negative review. Even if the food is poison, unless every restaurant's food is absolutely five-star perfect. So he's equating um, the napkins weren't folded properly at the table with uh, there were rats on my plate. It's just it's, it's so obvious, Jason. It's so obvious that there's no commensur commensurability between abortion and gun control laws or Medicaid funding. But here is the intellectual swindle that the Catholic left has been getting away with. Because Orthodox Catholics have not been calling them out, calling them out as liars, like their father, the liar, who is a liar and has been a murderer since the beginning. When, 
here is the intellectual swindle, and it's important to identify it. The so-called seamless garment, which you and I agree was a poison pill that Cardinal Bernadine cooked up to protect his friends like Mario Cuomo and Geraldine Ferrara. The, the seamless garment says, you can't oppose killing babies for sexual convenience unless you agree with me on all the ways to improve human life across the board and extend it as long as possible. Everything is a life issue. Well, insofar as every political issue affects human life, everything is a life issue, right? So if you're not for banning smoking in restaurants, you're pro, you're pro death. If you're not for lowering the speed limit to 25 miles an hour, then you're not pro-life because more people will die in traffic accidents. It's so obvious. It's so, it's not even something a freshman would make a mistake on in a logic class in college because it would have been beaten out of him in high school. If equating intentional killing on the one hand with quarrels, arguments about how best to order society, how best to balance things like people want to drive fast so they can get to work, but if they drive too fast, more of them will die. So where where is the optimum? Where is the golden mean, the best stance we can take that takes account of the sanctity of human life, takes account of the fact that we need to be able to drive at a decent speed in order to get to work, or people's lives will be suffer- will, will be shortened. Food will spoil. Doctors won't get to the hospital on time. They, I mean, all the arguments on why you don't have a 25 mile an hour speed limit. They are saying arguments about the speed limit are life issues. Everything is a life issue. Therefore, nothing is a life issue. If everything is sacred. Nothing is sacred. If all numbers are equal, you don't have a number system anymore. This is obviously just somebody, some kid peeing in the pool and, and announcing it so everybody has to get out of the pool. The intention of this is to make the pro life movement completely utopian and insane so that we don't have to worry about it anymore, so that the Democrats who want to kill babies but want to give great big bags of money to the bishops, can go on marching up to communion as a photo op. That's all it is. So we can't pretend to respect these people or pretend that we think they're sincere. They don't deserve it. It's a lie. Yeah, but you're right. You just hit the nail on the head, right? Because all the issues in the seamless garment other than abortion has to do with supporting giving big bags of money to the bishops. Somehow, yeah. Khartoum dropping barrel bombs on the Nuba and the Nuba Mountains doesn't fit. Uh, Three million Uyghur slaves and CCP concentration camps doesn't fit. Uh, you know, I think, I mean, if, if we're going to expand life issues, I really do think that to support open borders, you shouldn't present yourself to communion because it's a life issue. And to, you know, but I guess, I guess we can't do that, but I feel it's so obvious that to support open borders – is to support death and mayhem uh, inflicted upon the most vulnerable people in America and vulnerable migrants. It seems so obvious to me that, you know, you shouldn't present yourself to communion unless you support border security. I guess they're just not that bright, right? I guess I have to... Now, but when you have someone like well, Cardinal not, Wilton Gregory... The thing is, they're not, sincere, they're not sincere, Jason. That's what you need to remember. It's not that they're stupid. It's that they're lying. It's not that they're bad Catholics, it's that they're non-Catholics. They're frauds, they're phonies, they're whores. Don't, don't fool yourself. Don't get frustrated when arguments don't prevail with such people. It's like arguing with the demon inside a possessed person. Logic is not going to prevail here. You're right. Now, so that's... That's the seamless garment. There are two other opportunities. So we're going to have a great opportunity over the next six months from now until November to really wage an aggressive battle. And I think we have to stand on the rooftops and point out their hypocrisy and their fraud. Uh, And they're going to have the full weight of the morning shows, the late night talk shows, cable news, uh, politicians, the left, uh, to push their narrative. But I think we're going to win. 
Now, the other opportunity we have is the church's teaching on the Eucharist. I mean, I think this is a, if, if I'm a faithful bishop or priest, I'm looking at what's going to be happening between now and November is an amazing opportunity to get people back to confession and to get people uh, to understand what the church teaches about the Eucharist. Well, if I had my druthers, if I were a bishop in that, I, let's say, if, or if I could get the ear of the good bishops, here's what I would recommend to them. A one-year moratorium on distributing Holy Communion at Mass, period, to anyone. If you want to receive Holy Communion, please come to confession, and the people who leave the confessional, there'll be a priest distributing communion to them. Do that for one year to reestablish in people's minds the link between confessing your mortal sins and going to Holy Communion. And the reason I say that is, it would be better if nobody went to communion ever than for one person to go and receive unworthily, because that's a blasphemy and an additional mortal sin on his soul. It doesn't help him, it harms him. So by letting people receive communion week after week after week while never darkening the door of the confessional, you are harming them. You might as well give them out unfiltered cigarettes. Or well, That would be actually a charity. If you'd say, here's an unfiltered cigarette, I'm not giving you the Eucharist. Yeah, there we go. Maybe that's it. That yeah, you, you should, yeah get, get, if you, when you go to confession, you get a sticker. And you can put it on your head that Sunday morning. It's only good for a week. And if you go up without the sticker, they give you a cigarette. Now, now, someone who's not yeah. Catholic, they're listening and they're confused, or they're a poorly formed Catholic. They're confused, and they don't. They, they're like, "What in the world are they talking about?" Okay, right. receiving Holy Communion is something that greatly benefits your soul, unless you're in a state of mortal sin and you know it. In which case, it's an additional mortal sin, and not even a fun one. If you're going to go commit an additional mortal sin, you know. Make make it one that's worth it. So why explain <laughs> to them? Why, explain to them. Explain, them, explain them why we think it's a mortal sin. Well, the church says so. You're not supposed to be in a state of mortal sin when you go to communion. If you go in a state of mortal sin, that is yet another mortal sin. It doesn't undo your sin; it compounds it. It's like every time a priest who's having sex in the rectory, every time he says mass, his saying of mass is an act of blasphemy. It'd be better if he didn't say it. So. Given that maybe 2% of Catholics who go to communion also go to confession, and given that they're fallen human beings in a, a fairly corrupt world, I'd say a lot of them are committing mortal sins that, that they know are mortal sins and they're not repentant. They haven't gone to c confession. They shouldn't go to Holy Communion. So I would like to see the bishops not just deny communion to obvious allies of mass murder like Joe Biden, I would like to see them limit Holy Communion to a little service immediately after confession. That's genius. Also, yeah, thank you. Well, it, can we for say one too, year. Can we also say that there is one year on an wait? You start it the day after Easter Sunday, and it goes for one year. And at the end of that year, scarcity creates value in people's minds. Right. That's why inflation degrades the value of the currency. If people can't receive communion because they've been told the church is sick, no one's going to confession. We're not giving communion out at mass for a year. By the end of it, they will realize how special it is. No, that's I've yeah, I've never heard you mention that to me before in our hundreds and hundreds of phone calls. I've never heard anyone else suggest that. I think that's brilliant. And I just want to say the reason the church teaches that you um by the way, I have to confess to you, uh, I have received communion before in a state of moral sin, and, and it haunts me. It's a dreadful thing. Um, but the reason why we believe this is because um, the church teaches, and if you're a Catholic, you believe that the bread and wine used in communion becomes, it is actually the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It's not a symbol or something we do to remember. And if you don't believe right. that, then you're not. Then you should just stay home and watch inside the NFL on Sundays, or That's right. Saint Paul talked about Saint Paul talked about eating and drinking death by receiving the Eucharist unworthily. That's right there in the New Testament. And if I were a Protestant, I would know what verse it was. Right. It's uh, 
Oh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know the verse, but I knew, I do know John six. I do know, I do know John six, six six, which is when Jesus gave his teachings on communion in the Eucharist. Said many John six six six. Then many left and walked with him no more. Uh, so you can't forget that in John chapter six, right? Um, right, and I think if we stop giving Holy Communion at Mass, a lot of people if they don't get the participation participation trophy, are going to stop coming to the game. Um, they th- Those people really ought to take a vacation and take a vacation from going to Mass and receiving communion and really re-examine what they believe and why they're doing it. And why be Catholic if you don't believe that? Because uh, you're not, right? So you're not Catholic if you don't believe it. Why receive, the com- right? why receive communion anyways unless... It's you have some right. sick, upset. Did I tell you I almost got in a fight at church two weeks ago? Somehow I'm not surprised, but tell me, tell me why. All right, so it was only our second time at this new church because I, won't have, I wouldn't have my children suffer the indignity of seeing other people wear masks or them, they themselves have to wear masks at mass. So we went to a, um, a missionary parish where we never had to wear masks or social distance. When and we just moved to Texas. When our parish opened up, or it didn't open up, but no longer required masks or social distancing, we were t- we went there. Uh, two weeks ago, I was on the road last week, so the week before last, um, only our second time there. I'm sitting there receiving the Eucharist. I go back, I kneel down, and then can you believe? Out of the corner of my eyes, I can't believe what I see. Um, I see a man look at the Eucharist like it disgusts him. Like, it disgusts him. He just looks at it like, ugh, what am I going to do with this? It's in my hand. And this is after he turned the corner and he's walking back to his chair. Hands it to this woman next to him. I discovered later it was his wife. She looks embarrassed and confused and she consumes it. I look at her. She laughs nervously and then breaks down crying. So that tells you what she must have seen in my face. She goes back and sits down. I get up. I walk back around, I grab the usher, I say, this is what I saw, maybe I didn't see it, pray God I didn't see it, can we, can we talk to them afterwards? So mass ends, my family comes back, they're standing around me, other people saw this too, and they came up and they realized what I was going to do with the usher, other people that saw this, and I was, I have a thin veneer of sanity that I can put out there. Um, but it's very, I can vouch for that. yeah, it's very thin. Can you vouch? Yeah. You're vouching that it's thin. The veneer is thin. Yeah. And once punctured, it's over. It's like over. And so I put on this really like Nietzsche said about the English and I'm English. We put on a thin veneer of being civilized because really we're the worst barbarians in the world. And so I put on this <clears throat> thin veneer of, you know, I'm like, excuse me, sir. Uh, I have a question. I hope I didn't see this, but I believe that I saw you hand the Eucharist to this woman. Did you do that? And, you know, the usher, the poor usher is like 95 years old. And I'm, oh, like, yeah, right. I'm like, did you do that? And he's like, yeah, I did. And I'm like, miss, are you a uh, Catholic? She goes, no. And I said, did you know you're not supposed to receive it? Before she could answer, her husband said, um, yeah, we don't believe in that. I turned to him and I said, well, I know, sir, you, are you Catholic? He goes, yes, I'm Catholic. He goes, this is your wife. This is my wife. And at Broadway, I'm already furious. Like I'm raging inside. So I'm like so proud of myself. Yeah. That I, and I'm even after he said, I don't believe in it. I'm still, you know, calm. And I said, well, I just want you to understand that what the church teaches is to receive communion when you're in a state of mortal sin or not Catholic. It's, it's, it brings, um, it's, it's not a blessing, right? It brings wrath and death upon you. And you wouldn't want, and he said, I told you, I don't believe in that crap. Do you feel better? I said, no, when I knock you out, I'm going to feel better. That's when I'm going to feel better. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. That was the right, re- that was the right response. Well, I'd asked there a priest are, this are... week what I, I, what, how I should yeah. have responded. And he said, oh no, you did it exactly the right way. Well, right. I mean, w- there are martyrs of the Eucharist. Not a lot of people talk about this, but one of the governor, a governor general of Canada that is the queen's representative, the person who is the highest per, highest per, head of state in Canada is the governor general appointed by the Queen of England. Um, it's a ceremonial post. There was a, a French Canadian in the late 1960s, I don't remember his name, uh, who was the governor general of Canada. And a church caught fire. 
and he raced into the church to try to rescue the Eucharist so it wouldn't be destroyed by the fire. And he died, and he's considered a martyr. That's the kind of thing Catholics who believe in the Eucharist do. They don't hand it to their non-Catholic wife because they don't believe in it either. And if for you, your response of outrage was a correct one and an appropriate one. Ideally, the church would have young, burly ushers who could enforce the church's rules themselves. But you as a layman have certain rights and certain duties. So if you saw someone, if somebody handed a, a centerfold of, of a porn magazine to your 11-year-old daughter, you would be outraged and you might take direct action. This is a similar case. Yeah, and if you're not Catholic, you don't get it. You don't get it. Respect. Show respect that you would show to any other community that we're not the one community that you can come into our house and piss on the floor. But people think that, right? And this guy thinks he's Catholic. Not he's not Catholic. He, he, he was maybe baptized Catholic. He might have an Irish last name. He thinks he's Catholic, so he thinks he can come in the house and piss on the floor. It's not your house, brother. And that's what I told him. I and said, come back here again. House. I said, this is only my second week in this parish. And you're lucky it hasn't been. It's not my fifth week because uh, it had been over already. I said, come back and don't show respect. Show respect. Yeah, it's, it's, not that it's, our, it's not that it's our house. That's true. It is God's house, and we're yes. defending him. Yes, it's I It's not like somebody takes a dump in, the lion, in, your, in your chapter of the Lions Club. You know, you might want to punch that guy in the face, but it's a different thing. This is more like somebody taking a whiz on the tomb of the unknown soldier or, or throwing a tomato at the statue of Abraham Lincoln on Juneteenth Day. This is something that doesn't just represent, but it metaphysically embodies something much bigger than you or I. And that's why we defend it. It's not that it's a mark of our, of our tribe or our club. It's that we are defending something much higher and more important than we are. So in a sense, pro-abortion politicians commit a grave injustice against unborn children. They also commit a hideous injustice against God himself when they presume to take the Eucharist in open defiance of the most fundamental thing God said in the book of Genesis, that the world is good. And he made man and human life is good. Abortion is a rejection of the idea that life is good. It's the most fundamental saying of no to God and yes to Satan. You're agreeing with Satan that mankind's creation was a bad thing, that life is not worth living, that this child, if, if he's not going to come into a perfect world, he's better off dead in a medical waste dumpster or getting sold to a pharmaceutical company. And people who don't agree with us but agree with Satan about that should not be receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's yeah. simple. And they shouldn't have a, They don't have a dog in the sun. You go, yeah, it's not my issue. I'm not Catholic. I don't agree with that. You, they, they can do what they want in their house. I don't know why the whole world feels like they have a say without even being thoughtful enough to investigate what we teach, why we teach, and what we believe. You know, I, ha I had this thought. Well, by the way, I want to make this point. What I saw that guy do with the Eucharist, that's how I feel every time I see Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi receive communion. And it's the same exact thing. It's, exact, it's actually what they do is worse because it's merely for yeah. votes. Um, but John, what right. do you think about this right. thought that I had? Um, I thought, you know, I don't believe that Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi or any of their ilk actually believe that the Eucharist is, becomes the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. I don't believe they believe that. And I also don't believe that they value human life at all in the womb or out period. So it's the collision. Right. It reveals two truths. They don't believe in the Eucharist, and they don't believe in the inviolable dignity of the human person. Right. Period. And this is an opportunity to see the two most important things in the world for us as Catholics. Um, it's exposed that these are unbelievers in human dignity, unbelievers in the Catholic faith, and it's tragic to so discover so many of our bishops yeah. also clearly are being, are, are, are clearly uh, being revealed don't as unbelievers. Either. Yeah. So if you reject the Eucharist, you're rejecting faith. And if you reject the value of human life, you're rejecting reason. 
So all that's left is instinct, appetite, assertion of the will. You're, you've reduced yourself to the level of an animal, of a beast of the field. Sorrowful. Okay, I want to just shift gears real quick because I know I'm getting ready to go on a kayak trip for a week. I will be uh, leaving in a few hours with my boys, and for seven days we will be in a river paddling through several states. And you're heading out to a movie. Um, but I just, I, you're, you're, the, you're my favorite writer. Your most recent article I have not, I think it's your most recent one I just saw on my feed. Tom Hanks should have jumped in the mountain. I want everyone to follow you at the stream. I think most people do. You probably brought me most Stream. of the Stream.org. Stream.org. I write five days a week. My latest piece is called This Woke Critic Wants Tom Hanks to Jump into the Volcano. And it's about a black left-wing movie critic. He's criticizing Tom Hanks. Now, Tom Hanks wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. Tom Hanks is a good Hollywood liberal, but he's not one of the ones who's super obnoxious and in your face about it. Uh, but he wrote a, an article for the New York Times that I agree with that horrible atrocities have occurred in American history that not enough of us know about. For instance, the 19, I think it was 21, Tulsa massacre. A bunch of white racists up in arms that the, black, that the nearby black community was prosperous and successful. They marched into a black neighborhood and started murdering people and burning their stores and assaulting people. They killed like 36 American citizens. And this was able to happen because racist gun control laws weren't – gun control laws were introduced in many southern states and only applied to black people. Um, so the whites were armed. The blacks weren't. Uh, and it was a massacre. It was hideous, and it's shocking that this happened in the 1920s. But then again, that's when the Ku Klux Klan had its resurgence. Tom Hanks said it would be a good thing if we taught this to kids in school, and I agree with him. This – I also think we should teach about the racist roots of Planned Parenthood and about the eugenics motivation behind Roe v. Wade, which uh, Justice Ginsburg admitted. Um, anyway, this black critic said, Tom Hanks is not a racist, but he needs to be anti-racist. He needs to go further. He needs to atone for his own sins. And do you know, Jason, what the sins Tom Hanks committed, according to this critic, were? He has repeatedly played roles where a white man is a decent and good and virtuous human being. He's done that many times, maybe too much. He's actually typecast himself, kind of like Jimmy Stewart. Um, and that is the problem, because by making movies like Saving Private Ryan uh, where, or Forrest Gump, where a white man does good things, he is spreading the idea that white people can be good. And this is not what should be taught in America. So Tom Hanks should make reparation for his lifetime of portraying decent white people. I don't know, I guess by making movies that demonize white people. You know, that's you, what I had to, you so know, I was comparing that to the, to the movie Joe versus the volcano, a 1990 comedy where Tom Hanks, they want him to jump into a volcano to stop it from erupting because the native. Uh Oh, did I lose you, John? He has a terminal illness, and they, they give him a luxurious cruise to the South Seas, and his, what he has to do is jump into the volcano at the end. And in the article, I say that systemic racism, uh, toxic whiteness, these are all the fake illness that they're, they're trying to convince each of us we have, and they want us to jump into the volcano. Well, I saw Joe versus the Volcano, and it was an awful movie, and I, I would want to... You I liked it? I wanted to jump in a volcano after I saw it. It's one of my favorite movies ever. Maybe I, I watched it when it came out. I was probably 19 years old. I will, I will try to watch it again. Um, it's a, great, it's you, a great American comedy. You know what angers me most, though, about that whole story? Nothing upsets me more. I ruin so many relationships before they even have a chance to get started at dinner parties when people come up to me and say, you know what movie you need to make? That's how you, if you want to make me despise you, come up to me and say, you know what movie you need to make? Because making movies as someone who makes movies is very, 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 very hard. It takes years, involves being away from your family for months and months and months to find the money, months and months and months to make the movie, and months and months and months and months and months and months, and months to market the movie. So it's like, hey, 
Here's an idea I thought about for 10 seconds that I want to uh, give you a 10-year work assignment that will add up to about two years of being away from your family. You ready? And uh, Well, so- you should – here's the response you should give. Okay. Well, you know, you know the child you should raise? You know, we need more brain surgeons. So I think you should go get your wife pregnant – and put that kid through medical school so you can become a brain surgeon because we need more brain surgeons. That should be your response. Yeah, I tell him to join the army. I go, you know what you need to do? Join the army. You should join the military. Oh, that's good. You should join the military, (laughs) and you should probably stay in the military for 10 years. You're going to be going on deployments. You might die, (laughs) but that's – so So when people tell people what kind of movies – I don't care who you are, Hitchcock, whoever. It doesn't matter who you are. You're not making that many movies. You got more stories in your head that inspire you than movies you're going to make. I don't need, unless you're going to pay for the movie up front, like, hey, here's the money. Here's a story. Do you like it? Yeah, I'll fund, I'll fund the whole thing. Yeah, okay, then tell me. So the fact yeah. that they're going to order Tom Hanks to make woke movies, just the part that makes me most upset is you're telling him to make movies. Like, what? Well, the part that upsets me most is they want all white people to jump into volcanoes. But I agree with you. I'm, <laughs> I want your, white your people problem. that tell me what movies to make to jump into volcanoes. <laughs> That's what I want. And the last part thing I wanted to talk about just briefly is uh, my next column. It talks about the U.S. Catholic bishops and Joe Biden receiving communion. It also talks about Texas Governor Greg Abbott abandoning the dogs of the state of Texas. He vetoed a bill, very simple, straightforward, common sense bill. Maybe you didn't even know this was necessary. Do you know it is not illegal in Texas to leave your dog chained up in the sun without water till it dies? And until it's dead, you're not doing anything illegal. So a sheriff can't save that dog. A neighbor can't save that dog. Animal control can't do anything until the dog dies. And then you could be charged with animal cruelty. Somebody, uh, Texas Humane Legislation, Legislative Network, tried to pass a bill. Actually, they got it through both houses of the Texas legislature, mandating that if you leave a dog outside in the Texas sun on a chain, you at least have to have some water for it. Greg Abbott just vetoed that. That's that's bizarre. You know, look, I have a when when I when I heard you had somehow inserted dogs into this article, I was like, oh no. But I just, you know, there's a sacramental nature of how human beings treat animals, and especially like dogs and horses and cats. Yeah. There's, there's a sacramental nature that it kind of tells me how you would treat human beings if given the chance. Um, exactly. There's a you know we all saw this. As, yeah, we we all saw as children, right? There were children when we were kids right. that every neighborhood had um, the psycho kid, right? And that psycho kid in my neighborhood is in prison. Uh, I I know I used to- solid solid documentary uh, it's experimental proof. Children who torture animals frequently turn out to be psychopaths who later go on to be predators on fellow human beings. And you have to wonder, like, when uh, my, my wife and I have called the Humane Society on relatives who do this. Wow. I, have to, I hope they don't listen to the podcast. <laughs> who have had their dog chained up and with no water in the sun, and we have said, what are we going to do about this? We're, we're going to make a call. That's all we're going to do. We're going to make a call. Yeah, okay, and I you. always wonder, what in the world are you thinking, you know, what exactly. is what is going on? If there's kids in the house, you kind of wonder what's going on to the kid in the house if you got a dog on a three-foot chain in the hot sun all day. It, it, at the exactly. very least, you're absolutely devoid of empathy. Right, right. Now, Greg Abbott has done some other terrible stuff. He uh, he he got his allies in, in, in the legislature to kill in committee a law that would have banned the chemical castration of children by transgender clinics. He killed that bill. And it later came out that he and his top Republican allies um, have gotten half a million dollars from a transgender clinic that does chemical castrations. So t- Greg Abbott is a rhino. He is to the left of Jeb Bush. 
but he's trying to position himself as a Texas conservative. And uh, we need to expose him for what he is, which is a political opportunist. And we need to get him out in the next Republican primary. Well, here's the good news about that uh, for the pro-life movement, that these, if he is a rhino, and I'm new to Texas, and I've seen Abbott at a lot of pro-life events. He signed some great pro-life legislation. If he is a rhino, um, I'm going to withhold judgment on that. The fact that he feels that he virtue signals to the right on the life issue, I think for the pro-life movement is a good sign that that we are becoming, at least in some states like Texas, a no-go zone. That's right. You just do what that lobby says, whether you want to or not. That's, because uh, that's right. They, you know, they're powerful. And I will say the pro-life organizations here in Texas, if they got some muscles, they flex, and they got Texas a Texas right to life is one. Texas right to life is wonderful. You can tell because the most of the bishops in Texas can't stand them. That's because it. Because they're more pro-life than the bishops. Huh, man. Yeah, well, I think Bishop probably are, most people in Texas are more pro-life than the bishops. Most, yeah, I, I, yeah, you know, because, the average Texan is probably more pro-life than uh, Supich. Well, wouldn't be much. I mean, well, I, um, Cardinal McCarrick didn't pick most of the residents of Texas. Bam! <laughs> well, I think that's what we should end on. I gotta go, Cardinal guys. McCarrick. I'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks, John. Let me put this on mute. Bye. Hello. All, right. all right, that's the line of all lines. Cardinal. McCarrick did not pick most of the residents of Texas. How would you like to know you held your job? How would you feel if uh, a guy like at your office, a guy like Cardinal McCarrick, you were his pet, he promoted you all the way up to where you are now? How would you feel at Christmas parties? How would you feel when you walked into the lunchroom, break room? Wouldn't you be kind of like, I need a new job. I need to... I need to, a lateral move. I need to get into another company where they don't understand uh, who put me here and uh, how he built relationships with his employees and uh, how he promoted. All I'm saying is if I were in that position, I would feel queasy all of the time. All right, I just want to make this point clear again. I th- I'm going to do the intro after this. Um, but this is what I'm hoping to do in the next year as we see this dispute around should politicians who support the taxpayer funding of the intentional direct killing of vulnerable human beings who are Catholic present themselves to communion. This is an amazing opportunity because, one, we get to tell the world what the church teaches about the Eucharist and communion and confession. We get to teach the world on what the church teaches on human dignity And three, once and for all, we can expose the seamless garment as nothing but a fraud. As John Zmirak says so eloquently, it's it's the swimming pool uh, of prudential issues in which they submerge the child in the womb to drown them, the child in the womb in a a sea of prudential issues. And um, we'll also get to demonstrate, listen, here's what you know, whether you agree with me or not. You can be a troll listening in. For Alan Guttenmacher Institute with your notepad, and you're not Catholic, if you were raised Catholic, you know that Gregory and others like him, Cardinal Gregory, D.C., and others like him, who act confused on this issue or or they, they conflate abortion with the death penalty or with immigration or with minimum wage, you know they're being dishonest, that they're liars, And you have to ask yourself, why don't they just have the courage to say they don't believe in what the church teaches? Just say that. I don't believe what the church teaches in the Eucharist. I don't believe in what the church teaches on the inviolable dignity of the human person or mortal sin or confession. I don't believe in any of that. Like the guy said at my parish two weeks ago that I was about to bop in the nose. I don't believe in any of that crap. Joe Biden should look at the camera in the eye and say, I don't believe in any of that crap. I don't believe in what the church teaches on the Eucharist. I don't believe in the inviolable dignity of the human person. I do not believe in that crap. That's what Joe Biden should say. And then Gregory should say, you know what? Neither do I. So let's start our own church. Let's start our own little club. No, because they want the power and the prestige that comes along with the church. Because what they want is money and what they want is power. And the child in the womb is roadkill to them. That's it. That's all. That's the sad fact. And now 
thanks to the bishops announcing they're going to have this letter, we know that two things are going to happen. They're going to try to kick this can down the road forever. Or they're going to try to inflate this document to the point of utter meaninglessness, which, if they hold to it, means no Catholic ever can receive communion because unless you are in perfect uh, 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 agreement with the... Um, you know, those guys that write the policy papers for the bishops, I know them, they are dolts. They are not bright at all. They're not impressive. They're just no spiritedness. There's not a lot going on between the years. They're not impressive. They're basically policy papers that special interests give them white papers. And then they, they kind of massage them to kind of look like they're somehow Catholic. That's all they, that's all they do. And so unless what this is like the, the bishops voter guides, like Cardinal uh, I mean, uh, Bishop Barron's voter guy, just a monstrosity of meaninglessness. So that's what's going to happen, but this is all good news because it's going to be a great opportunity for us to tell the truth about the Eucharist, the truth about human dignity, and the truth about what a consistent Catholic social teaching looks like. And let me just sum it up before we sell pillows. A consistent Catholic ethic of life it's for protecting the child in the womb from the very moment of its biological beginning. A consistent ethic of life would not be muzzled, right? A, a Catholic concerned about consistently advocating for life would not cut a secret deal with the CCP that came with a muzzle to silence Catholics on the greatest genocide since the Holocaust and Chinese occupied East Turkestan, and even the arrest of our own bishop, priests, seminarians, and Catholic lay people that is happening across China and in Hong Kong. That's not a, no, a consistent ethic. A Catholic who's advocating a consistent ethic of life would be standing on the rooftops shouting for the Uyghur, standing on the rooftops shouting for their co-religionists in China and in Hong Kong. By the way, I'm not an exemplar. But I'm doing that. You're doing that. That's why you listen to the Jason Jones show. And, you know, I'm going to even go further. I'm going to even go further, maybe a little of a stretch. I think a, a Catholic concern about a consistent ethic of life would work to protect migrants from exploitation in a dangerous underground economy. How about that? They would work to protect migrants from being lured across a dangerous border into an underground economy where they would be exploited, where they'd be trafficked, right? That's what I think. But who knows? You know, I'm just a high school dropout. I'm just a high school dropout, and I'm about to go. I'm going to be gone for a week. I don't know when my next show is going to come out. My sons and I and some friends, we're jumping in a ki some kayaks, and we're going to kayak down this river. I'll tell you all about it when we get back. It's going to be several days of kayaking through what looks to be like tremendous thunderstorms and there'll be mosquitoes and there'll be alligators uh there'll be uh we'll be praying the rosary and barbecuing and camping along the river and i really really can't wait i told my family that this summer was going to be a summer of celebration we spent a week on a river i worked the whole time, got a lot done on the river, I mean, on, the, on a lake. We worked a week on a lake. Now I was just in Washington, D.C., and now we're going to spend a week on, on a river. And, um, yeah, so I want to give my children a beautiful summer after that, that dark, dark year. This episode has been brought to you by Movie to Movement. Go to uh, movietomovement.com, check out all of our films. But I want you, if you haven't watched Divided Hearts of America already, come on. Wherever you download films, Divided Hearts of America is there. And it, Benjamin Watson, discovers the secret to what is dividing America. And when you watch the movie, give us the rating you think it deserves. Now, I think you're going to think it deserves five stars. And then write something nice wherever you saw the film. If it's an Amazon, an Amazon. Redbox, Redbox. Give us a review. And uh, tell us what you think about the film. This episode is also being brought to you by the Vulnerable People Project, standing in solidarity with the vulnerable. I just got back from Washington, D.C. last week, 
was one of the most, we had, we've got a lot done. I couldn't believe it. Several speeches, met with uh, a lot of folks of influence, did some media. I did Steve Bannon's The War Room, I think twice, maybe. Did I do it twice? Did several podcasts and uh, some TV interviews. Um, yeah, and so that was great, but we need your support. We need you to become a monthly donor. The Vulnerable People Project is on the front lines of standing with the most vulnerable people in the world. Go to thegreatcampaign.org. Become a monthly donor, thegreatcampaign.org. We need you. Our budget is always being stretched to the limit. I am like Patton. I go well ahead of my gas lines all of the time. And so we need your help. And as always, this episode is being brought to you by MyPillow.com. You know my pillow. It doesn't get hot. You don't have to flip it. If you live in Florida, Texas, Arizona, and you don't have my pillow. I know you're waking up 10 times a night. It's not going to be the hottest summer on, on the books is what we're being told. That means you need my pillow now. And uh, so go to mypillow.com, use the code Jones. All right. The next time I talk to you, I will be sunburned from head to toe. There will be not two inches of space on my skin where there is not a mosquito bite. And, uh, but I will probably have lost 10 pounds. So despite the skin cancer and the malaria, uh, it'll be good. I cannot wait. All right, until next time. It's the Jason Jones Show. This has been the Jason Jones Show. Powered by Mudhouse Media. Mudhouse Media.